Good morning. This morning, as it's been told to you already, this morning I'll be going through Colossians chapter 3, 1 through 11. 1 through 11. And just a little recap of Colossians so far before we get there. Paul writes this letter to the church in Colossae, and he's trying to deal with problems, with issues in the church. There's problems, all these different types of problems. Uh, uh, legalism, you know, uh, you have to eat, people are trying to teach it, you have to eat certain foods, you got to stay away from certain foods, you have to be circumcised still, you have to withhold man-made laws of the Sabbath still. You, uh, some people are teaching that you should worship angels. Some people are teaching Gnosticism, the belief that you have some secret hidden knowledge within yourself, and if you could just tap into that secret hidden knowledge... Right? You could be saved. Really, what all these lead to, all these problems, what they lead to is idolatry. Right? All these things, all these earthly things become more important than Christ. And so right away in chapter 1, what Paul does is he redirects our focus to Jesus. That Jesus is the preeminent one. He is over everything. Everything is created by him and for him. Actually, let me just read a little bit of it. In chapter 1, starting in verse 15, he says, He is the image of the invisible God, the firstborn of all creation. For by him all things were created, in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities. All things were created through him and for him. And he is before all things, and in him all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning, the firstborn from the dead, that in everything he might be preeminent. For in him all the fullness of God was pleased to dwell and through him to reconcile to himself all things, whether on earth or in heaven, making peace by the blood of his cross." Right? He is supreme. He is the, the, the one everything is reconciled through. And in chapter 2, Paul goes on to tell us how we are now, those of us who've put their faith in Christ, we're now alive in Christ, right? We die to our old selves. We, we put that on the cross. We die to it. Now we live with Christ. We're reborn. We are a new person. He says we're buried with Christ in baptism and we are raised to life in Christ. He also tells us we are dead in our trespasses, right? We're dead in our sin. That's our state. That's our natural state. We're dead in our sins. But now because of Jesus, we are now alive in Jesus. It, it talks about, it has this language that God has canceled our legal debt. It has this legal legal language where it's as if you were actually in a courtroom and the judge is ready to pronounce the sentence you deserve and instead the judge provides his one and only son to take that penalty for you. And God nails that debt that we have, he nails it to the cross. So Paul talks about how as, as Christians we die to sin. The old person who we were no longer lives, but the new person lives. We now live in Christ. And you get this idea that for this reason, we should live to Christ. And, and he's going to start talking about things that we should reject, things that we should put off. We should reject earthly things. We should reject man-made religions like Gnosticism. We should reject legalism. You can't eat certain foods. You have to follow the Sabbath. You've got to be circumcised. We've got to reject idolatry, right? The worship of anything other than God. We need to reject sin. So if you are in Christ, you've died to yourself, you're dead to sin, you now walk in new life in Christ. He, he kind of ends chapter 2 by, by saying, no one can disqualify you. No one can basically disqualify you from the family. If you're in Christ. And so just as Steve said, as we get to chapter 3, this is where Paul begins to tell Christians that we need to look to things above and put off sin. We, as, as Steve said, 
our theology needs to turn into action, right? So far, chapter one and two has been a lot of theology. Paul has told us a lot of theology, what we need to think about and process, but I've heard this several times. Your, your, your belief in Christ needs to make its way from the head to the heart. All right, you, you, it's good to think about, but now it's time to put it into practice in your real life. And so Paul will spend three through the end of, of, of this letter talking about how to live as Christians. And don't get me wrong, we are, we are saved by faith alone in Christ alone, but, but that faith is supposed to be put into action. So Colossians chapter three, starting at verse one. He says, if then you have been raised with Christ, right? In other words, to those who are saved by faith in Christ, he says, seek the things that are above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So if you are, if you are in Christ, you're supposed to seek the things that are above. Why? He tells us because that's where Christ is. He's above. He's in heaven. He's seated at the right hand. Luke twenty two sixty nine. 69. Jesus says, but from now on, the Son of Man shall be seated at the right hand of the power of God. Peter says, 1 Peter three twenty two, referring to Jesus, who has gone into heaven and is at the right hand of God with angels, authorities, and powers have been subject to him. Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it says, He is the radiance of the glory of God and the exact imprint of his nature. And he upholds the universe by the word of his power. After making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. Here's the thing. Jesus is not in the grave. He's not in the grave. He's risen. He's at the right hand of the Father interceding for us on our behalf, and that's where we should focus our attention. That's where we need to focus. Now, I know I'm going to get this all tangled up. Some of you are like, oh, yep, see, there it goes. But how many of you, I, I want to give you an illustration Francis Chan does. How many of you have seen his rope analogy? Anybody? Yeah. Oh, man, look at that. I did a number on this already. Sorry, I'm going to get this. All right, let's just say that's 100 feet of rope. Imagine that this rope, it doesn't end there, right? It doesn't end where I tossed it. It doesn't end at the wall. Imagine this rope goes on forever, okay? It goes on eternally, never ends. And imagine that this rope represents your existence, right? This is the timeline of your existence. And the red part of this rope, just this little red part, is the time that you have here on earth. That's it. That's all you got. And then after, once you die, you will spend eternity somewhere else. And the Bible teaches us that, that what you decide here in this little, this little amount of time determines the rest of all of this. This is what I call an eternal perspective, right? You, and the problem is that we get so consumed by this. We are wrapped up in earthly things. You name it, you've got, 
And I'm guilty of this as much as anybody else. We're consumed by sports and careers and hobbies and sinful lusts of the heart. And it all turns into idolatry. Right? It's just focused on this. And when you look at this eternal perspective, you go, that is stupid. Like, are you kidding me? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be worried about a Nebraska football game when there's all of this. <laughs> you know, even Francis Chan gives the example. He's like, it's baffling sometimes because we'll, we'll work really hard and try to earn a bunch of money from here to here so that from here to here we can do nothing. But when you have this eternal perspective, you're like, that's crazy. I've sat in front of financial advisors who they say, John, boy, you're in trouble. I mean, if you don't save more money from here to here, you're not going to survive from here to here. And when I look at this, I'm going, I don't want to survive here to here. I want to survive this. Like, why do we focus so much on this? And Paul says we need to seek the things that are above where Christ is. We need to seek God's will, right? We need to have this eternal perspective because you want to know how to put off the old self? You focus on where Christ is. You focus on God's will. You want to know how to put sin off? Get it out of your life? You don't focus on this. You focus on the above. We're in heaven where Christ is and his will. You want to know how to deal with temptation? You focus on heaven. You focus on Christ and what he wants in your life. This can be a major distraction. I am not saying, I am not saying that we shouldn't be concerned about anything in this world. We have, we do have earthly responsibilities. We do. That's a biblical thing. We have earthly responsibilities. We're called to go and make disciples. We're called to have children, raise them in the way of the Lord. We're, we're called to be stewards of God's creation. Just trying to say that our focus needs to be on God. Our time and energy needs to be given to pleasing God. Right? Rather than what Paul, rather than earthly things. If all you have is this earthly perspective, then the things of this world become our God. They will rule over you. It becomes idolatry. You will worship earthly things, sinful things, if this is what you're focused on. Jesus talks about this, I think, several times. He talks about, he even chastises Peter at one point. Jesus, in, in Matthew 16, Jesus is telling the disciples, I'm going to die soon. And Peter, Peter is like, no, we're going to change that. I'm not going to let it happen. And in Matthew 16, 23, it says, but he turned and said to Peter, get behind me, Satan. You are a hindrance to me, for you are not setting your mind on the things of God, but on the things of man. He's saying, Peter, you're trying to disrupt God's will. And instead, you want earthly things. That's what Satan wants for your life. He doesn't want you to focus on the eternal. He doesn't want you to focus on God and God's will. He wants you to focus on this. And so part of focusing on the things above are focusing on God's will. In Matthew 6, 19 through 21, you know, Jesus says, Do not lay up for yourselves treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy and where thieves break in and steal, but lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven where neither moth nor rust destroys and where thieves do not break in and steal. For where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Right? If this is what you're focused on, that's where your heart is. And it ends. You can't take anything with you. And so when you have this eternal perspective, you're like, man, what am I focusing on? 
Matthew 6, 33, Jesus says, Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. So in Colossians 3, verse 2, Paul says, Set your mind on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. In fact, C.S. Lewis has a quote. He says, he says, aim at heaven, aim at heaven and you will get earth thrown in. Aim at earth and you will get neither. Right? If, 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 if this is all you're going to focus on, that's all you get is earth. If you're going to focus on the things of earth, that's it. That's all you're going to have. But if you focus on heaven, you know what? You may just bring some of heaven to earth. So we need to focus, we need to set our minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. Paul goes on in verse 3. He says, For you have died and your life is hidden with Christ in God. When Christ who is your life appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. Again, for you have died, it's, it's this repetitive concept throughout this letter. You, you, your old self has died. Your new self, I mean, we live in Christ. We're trying to become like Christ. And he uses this term, he said, and your life is hidden. And this term hidden in the Greek, it's, it's to be kept laid up with God in heaven. And actually, I believe what he's getting to is since we have died, we have died to sin. We've, our old self has died. We are now hidden from it. We are now hidden from our old selves. We are now hidden from sin in Christ with God. So that sin, our old selves, can no longer find us. Years ago, my dad was a pastor he pastored one year at Locust Grove Mennonite Church in Sturgis, Michigan. And I think I was around maybe five, six years old at that time. And we spent a lot of time at the church as kids, a lot of time. And I believe there was an Amish family that cleaned our church. And they would bring their kids with them when they cleaned. And so sometimes we would end up at the church at the same time. There, these, this Amish family kids and and. My, my sister and my brother, we'd all be there at the same time. And we decided one time we, to play hide and seek in the church with these Amish kids. And they had a really cute little, little boy, you know, had the Amish bowl cut, you know, the Amish clothes, no shoes, wouldn't wear any shoes. And he played with us and he didn't want to hide with anybody. He just wanted to hide by himself. We're like, great, fine. We got the game going. The person that was it eventually found everybody, right? Except for this little, like, three-year-old Amish boy. Couldn't find him. In fact, the rest of us had to, had to join in the hunt. We were going classroom to classroom, room to room, turning on the lights. We thought we were, had checked everywhere. Could not find the kid. We're calling his name. Couldn't find him. Eventually, you know, we're all calling out, and eventually he comes out of one of the rooms that we checked several times. It, I, honestly, it blew, as little kids, it blew our mind. We were like, he, he had to be so quiet wherever he was. I still don't even remember where he actually hid in the room, but we couldn't find him. I thought, you must have disappeared or something. <laughs> But my point is, just like we couldn't find, that little boy was so well hidden. I mean, I don't know if this is a correct term, but the best hider I've ever seen. <laughs> but if you want to be hidden from sin, never to be found again, be hidden in Christ. The other thing in this verse that I think Paul is trying to communicate Paul uses a lot of this language, hidden, secret, secret knowledge, secret wisdom, hidden secret knowledge. He uses this a lot. 
And at this time, like I've talked about many times, people were trying to teach in this church that this Gnostic, this Gnostic idea that you have a piece of the divine within you, hidden within you. And, and if you could just tap into the secret, hidden wisdom and knowledge, you could save yourself. And believe it or not, this, this same worldview, Gnosticism, exists all over this world today. It is the same view that says, just find your truth. Just find your, your individual truth. That's Gnosticism. And I think Paul is arguing against this belief here. He, he'll say in Colossians chapter 1, 26 through 27, he'll say, The mystery, hidden for ages and generations, but now revealed to his saints, to them God chose to make known how great among the Gentiles are the riches of the glory of this mystery, which is Christ, the hope of glory. He'll say in Colossians 2, 1 through 3, I want you to know how great a struggle I have for you and for those at Laodicea and for all who have not seen my face, me face to face, that their hearts may be encouraged, be knit together in love to reach all the riches of full assurance of understanding and the knowledge of God's mystery, which is Christ, in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. And he says, I say this in order that no one may delude you with plausible arguments. And I think what Paul is doing here is he's arguing against this Gnostic belief system. I think Paul is saying, hey, you want a secret hidden knowledge? It's Jesus Christ. You want, you want some secret knowledge? It's Christ. You, you want a treasure and all wisdom and knowledge? It's Christ. You know what you get when you become a Christian? It's more of Christ. He's the preeminent one. So Paul will say in verse 4, When Christ, who is your life, appears, then you also will appear with him in glory. And this is simply, Christ is not only our creator, he is our sustainer, he is our very life, he saves us, he is the bridge back to God, bridge re back to relationship with God, and when he returns, when he returns, we will be with him in glory. And so Paul is going to move on then to what does it look like to focus on these things that are above? What's this look like? And Paul is going to tell us what it looks like. Starting at verse 5. Paul says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desire, and covetousness, which is idolatry. On account of these, the wrath of God is coming. In these you too once walked when you were living in them, but now you must put them all away, anger, wrath, Malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices. Paul here actually lists 11 sins that we need to put off. And he divides them, the first list, five sins, sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil, desire, and covetousness. He divides them, from the other six. Now I don't, I'm not going to go through each and every sin this morning. That's, I'm trying to give more an overview of one through, verses 1 through 11. But one commentary describes this first list of sins. Sexual immorality, impurity, passion, evil desires, covetousness. Describes them as carnal indulgences. That which pertains to the body or its appetites, animal, fleshly, the sensual sins. The second list, sins of anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, lying. I, now, I've heard several things about this list, though. I've, I've read and, and listened to several things. I've heard people describe this as sins that you do in a social setting 
uh, uh, amongst other believers. That's the context of this. If you've put your faith in Christ. I've heard it described as sins of hostility or sins that are of vice, maybe. maybe. Maybe sins that we might consider little, right? Not very big sins. Compared to those sensual sins, maybe. But whatever the reason Paul separates this, this, these sins listed, here's what I want to focus on this morning. Verse 5, he says, Put to death, therefore, what is earthly in you. This is extremely strong language, put to death. In the Greek, it's actually a command. He's commanding people, put it to death. In other words, we need to kill sin. We need to kill it. We, you cannot gradually put off sin. You need to end it as if you had died. The answer to defeating sin is always the cross. You nail it to the cross. Your old self is dead. Galatians 2.20, Paul says, I have been crucified with Christ. It's no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. What do you do with sin? You crucify it. You kill it. You put it on the cross. You die to sin. You live to Christ. Let me use one of these sins in a, as an example quickly. Sexual immorality. The first one listed. Sexual immorality. In the Greek, the term is porneia. Does it sound familiar? What do you think the English word is that we get from that, that we derive from that? Pornography. Biblically, what sexual immorality means is any sexual act outside of a marriage between a man and a woman. They all knew this. When they said that term, that's what it meant. Jesus even uses this term in Mark's chapter 7. When he's talking about the evil things that come out of our heart, he uses the same term, sexual immorality. Any sexual act outside of a marriage between a man and a woman. Dr. Frank Turk, a Christian apologist on this topic of sexual immorality, says this, Biblically, all sex outside of a marriage between a man and a woman is considered sin. And he asked this question. He says this, Why is it worse if someone rapes you than if they just physically assault you? So in other words, which is worse? If someone were to punch you in the face, or if somebody were to rape you, which is worse? Oh, come on. We, the penalty, we know this. The penalty, what is worse is rape. Why? Dr. Turek says this, because sex is not just physical. It is emotional it's moral, it's biological, it's spiritual. There is something beyond sex than just the physical act, and we all know it. He gives this good example, this good illustration. Sex is like fire. Sex is like fire. If you put it in your fireplace where it belongs, it will warm you. It's good, it's moral. If you get it anywhere else in your house, it will burn your house down. My point here is you cannot gradually stop sin. And I believe that's what Paul's point is. You cannot gradually stop sexual immorality. What are you going to say? Okay, God, you know, this affair that I'm having... Instead of meeting up with her or him twice a month, I'll just go to once a month. Does that not sound ridiculous? Okay, God, I know I have a problem with pornography. I'll, I know I've been looking at it once a week, but hey, I'll just cut down to once a month. Like that doesn't make any sense. You can't gradually stop sexual immorality or impurity or passion or evil desires or covetousness because if you're doing it at all, you are sinning. 
And the consequences of sin go beyond yourself. You must kill it. You must put it to death. Jesus uses very harsh language also. He, he goes a step further. Cut it out. The things that may tempt you to sin, cut those things out of your life. He'll say in Matthew 5, 29 through 30, he says, if your right eye causes you to sin, tear it out and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body be thrown into hell. And if your right hand causes you to sin, cut it off and throw it away. For it is better that you lose one of your members than that your whole body go into hell. Now, Jesus isn't being literal here, but you get the point. Whatever is in your life that is causing you to sin, get rid of it. If you guys have, even young people, if you guys have groups of friends that are causing you to go into sin, get rid of them. It's better for you to have no friends than to end up in hell. Those of you, anybody in here take really good care of your lawn? You know, you get it sprayed. Um, there's like zero weeds in your, in your lawn. No one, none of you will probably even admit that. <laughs> okay, what happens if you find one weed in your lawn? Wipe it out. You pull it out. You kill it. Why? It'll spread. We have to kill sin in our lives, otherwise it'll grow. It'll spread in our lives. It'll rule our lives. One of the commentaries I was reading put it this way. It is necessary to mortify sins. In other words, it's, it's necessary to kill sins. It's necessary to put sins to death. Because if we do not kill them, they will kill us. If we don't kill them, they will kill us. So how do we kill sin in our lives, right? You, Paul's told us, right? You, you focus on what's above. You focus where Christ is. You focus on God's will in our lives. You flee sin. You run from it. You hide. You hide in Christ. Don't put yourself in situations that could lead to sin. Now, why should we avoid these sins? Why? Paul says in Colossians chapter 3, verse 6, he says, on account of these, the wrath of of God is coming. I hear so many professing Christians say, I hear it all the time, and not, not necessarily in this church, I hear people say, I, I can't stand this talk of God's wrath. I can't stand the talk of God's judgment. I don't, I don't want to talk about it. I don't, I don't want to think about it. I don't want to sing about it. I've had, I've had family members tell me, I don't even think it's true. There's no way God would do that to people. And it's like, well, I, I'm sorry. I don't know what to tell you. It's not me. It's, it's plastered all over in this book we call God's word. Jesus, Jesus talks more about hell and, and the consequences of, of how we live our lives more than anyone else. Have you read what he says in Matthew eleven twenty 20 through 24? It says, then he began to denounce the cities. He denounced the cities where most of his mighty works had been done. These are cities where he did the most mighty works. And he says, he denounces, denounces the cities because they did not repent. And he, he says, woe to you, Chorazin. Woe to you, Bethsaida. For if the mighty works in you had been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it will be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. 
entire city. He repeats himself for other cities. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? And he's basically saying, no, you will be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works done in you had been done in Sodom, Sodom and Gomorrah, it would have remained until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable on the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. And this is a warning. We need to repent. We need to get sin out of our lives. We need to kill it. Because whether you like it or not, God's judgment is coming. And here's the thing. I won't just leave you there. Thanks be to God. He's given us a way out of the wrath. He's given us his one and only son that if if we would believe in him, we can be saved from that. That's good news. Repent and believe. Paul will say, Colossians chapter 3, verse 7, he'll say, In these you too once walked when you were living in them. You once walked in these ways. You no longer do. You once walked in these sinful ways. You no longer do. This is so important to understand that the Bible tells us that just because Jesus saves, just because we have this free gift of salvation, doesn't mean we can go on sinning. We once walked in these ways, we no longer do. And I think it's extremely clear that we need to get sin out of our lives. And this actually goes against the progressive movements, which says you can have your cake and eat it too, right? You can follow Christ and you can still live a sinful life. And Paul's like, no, you once lived in that way, you don't anymore. He'll deal with this question in Romans 6, verses 1 through 2. He'll ask these questions, what shall we say then? Are we to continue in sin that grace may abound? Are we to continue in sin, I mean, just because Jesus has already saved us? He says, by no means, exclamation point. How can we who died to sin still live in it? Right, if we are dead in our, in our trespasses and we have died to our old self, and we've been raised to new life in Christ, we leave that dead sin behind. We don't look to it anymore. We put off the old self and put on the new. Verse eight, he says, but now you must put them all away. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, and obscene talk from your mouth. And do not lie to one another. I think Paul is, is, is just simply here trying to say, hey, you, you see these first list of big sins that are easy, easier to identify, right? Don't just put those away. We need to put all sin away, even the ones that we don't think are that bad. Anger, wrath, malice, slander, obscene talk, lying to one another. Verse 9 through the end. Verse 9 through the end. It says, Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have put off the old self with its practices and have put on the new self, which is being renewed in knowledge after the image of its creator. Here there is not Greek and Jew, circumcised and uncircumcised, barbarian, Scythian, slave, free, but Christ is all and in all. I think what Paul is really getting at, I think this is an identity issue. This is an identity issue. And I think everyone comes to a point in their life, and I really do mean everyone in the whole world, I really truly believe, everyone comes to a whole point in their life where they're like, who am I? Who are you? What is your identity? Paul will say in 2 Corinthians 5, 17, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Do, do you belong to the world? 
Is your mind set on earthly things? Do you act accordingly to the world? Or do you belong to Christ? Is your identity rooted in Christ? Are you hidden in Christ? Do you follow the will of God? Can you imagine, for a second with me, all of the issues that Paul had to deal with in the early church? And why he writes all these letters, all the issues, Jews in the, uh, what you would probably call a messianic Jew, those Jews who accepted Christ, wouldn't accept Gentiles initially because they didn't adhere to Jewish ceremonial or civil law. Some people in the church were trying to teach, you still need to be circumcised. You can only eat certain foods that, that you need to observe the Sabbath according to their traditions, that you should worship angels, that you need to uncover the secret hidden knowledge within yourself and all the different cultural battles he must face. Different religions and false teachings trying to creep into the church sounds a lot like what we still deal with. So there would have been all these different issues. And Paul is saying, I think Paul is saying, when you come to Christ, you no longer identify as, an old, as the old sinful person. You no longer identify in your sinful behavior. You no longer identify as a certain ethnicity because now you belong to Christ. You no longer fight for your culture because it's God's culture. You no longer allow false teachings and religions to creep in because it's Christ's church. That no matter what distinction you have, Jew, Gentile, man, woman, slave, free, we can all be united under the lordship of Christ. I have an aunt who always would ask her children, when, when they were at home, when her kids lived at home, before they would leave the house, she would always ask them, whose child are you? Has anybody done that to their kids? And they couldn't leave until they gave her the answer. And so just even while they're trying to get out the door, she's like, whose child are you? And they'd say, I forget the order, but they, it was like God and yours. That's what they had to say. But I think the point of that was, hey, remember who you are. Remember your true identity that when you go into the world and the world tempts you when you are tempted by sin, remember you belong to Christ. Remember to look towards the things that are above. So I'll end with this. When we go out into the world, we need to remember who we belong to. We need to look to things above where Christ is. We need to look to God's will. We need to put off sin. We need to kill it. We need to remove it from our lives and let Christ rule over us and the church. Why? Because to a Christian, Christ is all and in all. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I just thank you always for the opportunity to learn about who you are. For those of us who have put our faith in Christ, I just ask that we would all look to the things that are above, that we would look to your will and not our own, that we would, that we would let that old self die and that we would move towards you. And every day that we get up, up we put off sin and we put on Christ. We hide in Christ. And that we all would understand what Paul is trying to tell us at the end of this section, that these, these little things that we think divide us, you know, different cultures and stuff, we get rid of those. We get rid of what we thought that we could identify as, and, and we put on Christ as our identifier. Identifier not only to each other, but to the world. And I just ask these things in your name. Amen.